Welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to the episode of Outside the Panels. I'm your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes, and never let it be said that I, a true blue Dolphins fan, don't get enough enjoyment talking to Patriots fans and their comic books. What can I say? The world's full of them. What can I do? Right? I am talking this time around to not one, but two comic creators, writer and artist of a Kickstarter project. Area 51, the Helix Project, which is nearest fruition. I'm talking, of course, about Trevor Fernandez Lenkovich and Samuel Iwanze. Guys, how's it going? It's it's great to be here, Johnny. Thanks so much for having yeah. us. How did you so you? You're welcome. Hopefully, I've got your names relatively right. You yeah. you did a bang up job, my friend. <laughs> a little bit for me, but yeah, you tried. <laughs> you tried it. Right, I'm going now. Fine, be like that. <laughs> All right, all right, excellent. Let's get into this then. So, tell us about Area Fifty One, the Helix Project. Sure. Tell, what's the What's the kind of inspiration for this book? Yeah, well, the the sort of pitch of it, it is that it, it takes place in a nineteen seventies UFO hysteric America, uh -huh. under the shadow of the Cold War, and it presupposes that the alien specimen that was mass sighted in Roswell, New Mexico, in the late forties. Uh -huh. uh, masquerades as human for a few decades until he exposes his alien physiology in a last ditch attempt to save a human child's life. Uh, oh, but he's in, in doing so he's murdered in cold blood right in front of his son, Kent, who is our sort of point of view character for the story. Okay. And so Kent, ends up spending the next 13 years struggling to pick up the pieces and to, to reconcile his dueling sense of identity as a half human, half extraterrestrial mm -hmm. uh, until he's confronted by a mysterious letter claiming that the sender was not only there the day that his father was murdered, but that they somehow have a means of getting him back. So he's driven to uncover the circumstances surrounding his father's now supposed death. And obviously questioning the motivations of this cryptic person and uh, sort of meanwhile is dropped into the jaw of this genetics Cold War conspiracy um, and is really forced to face a twisted ghost from his past that plunges a dagger into everything he knows about himself and really what it means to be human. So it's a it's a deeply personal story. It takes advantage of my academic background in molecular and cellular biology, which I think adds um, kind of an element of authenticity to the sci-fi. Uh, and of course... You know, we've we've got Sam joining us um, for cover art and, and magical interiors, um, and it's I think I think we've managed to both capture the sort of grandeur of the sci-fi genre, but also those sort of deeply intimate and personal elements woven within the story as well. Cool. So Sam, you've been cover artist on all the issues, is that right? Yes, yes, I have. Really? In that case, boom! There you go. Check that out. Issue number one, correct? So yeah, so, so yeah, that's the the second printing. Uh, okay. So that one was done by Adrian Bonilla, who's Sorry. done all all of the <laughs> variant covers. No worries, it's a great cover. That's definitely one that I would flock to. Um, he has been the variant cover artist for the series as a whole, from start yeah. to finish. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't be more proud of of how great that one came out. Fine, all right, Sam. This is your big moment. I apologize wholeheartedly. Where are we up to? How about this one? Da -da! So, that? no. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> what are you um, doing to me? If you want to take a peek at the uh, the issue five covers, no, um, it's fine. We'll, we'll start. You did interior art as well, correct? So yeah. So, so yes, for issue five. Oh, issue five, right? Okay, cool. Fine. Leave this with me. I will arrange all these technical difficulties. It's Monday. So what can I say? No, I get it. Yeah, I get it too. So, Sam, what was it like stepping into this kind of this? So you've got this conspiracy, sci-fi, scientific, personal story. That's a that's quite a lot to get your head around as an artist, surely. Yeah, four issues in, and I was kind of... <laughs> yeah, there you go. Back on. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of nervous at first. I, I'm sure Trevor doesn't know this, but I was kind of nervous because reading the stories and everything, 
and I had to, I started off doing a variant cover for issue four, uh -huh. and I had to like get all the information and all the characters and get to know them in just about two to three days. Mm -hmm. And luckily with Trevor's help, I could get everything down to, okay, this is where we are now. Okay. But looking at it from reading the first issue, I have been so like blown away by how <laughs> convoluted and so like complex, but also very grounded the story was and story is. That's, that's so yeah, it. it's been fun. That's a huge, huge impact, isn't it? You've got science fiction up there and you've got that ground as human element. Yeah. yeah, what we'll do, we'll take a quick look at the Kickstarter video. Because we're clever like that. That I can do, he says, looking for it frantically. Um, <laughs> where are we at? Boom. So hopefully we should have that going just around and do. There we are. Right, here we go. So this is the Kickstarter video um have a listen and a watch and see what we all think here you go Wow, um, wow! <laughs> I'm like watching that. I'm like, whoa! How impressive Quite is that? Cinematic. It's like, whoa! It's like, wow! It looks great. I'm like, whoa! That was very impressive. Very, very impressive. All right, excellent. So you've got it's the seventies. It's a cold war. You've got aliens. You've got conspiracy. Um, you know what I'm going to suggest, don't you? You know, is there a little bit of Mulder and Scully going on? How did the X Files impact you with this? So it's it's funny. Um, I I grew up relatively like unexposed to a lot of entertainment media, and that was a, a comparison um, that's sort of been drawn between the Helix Project from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I have never seen the X Files. Um, I didn't really know what the X Files were until the comparisons were made. Um, so. Not so much, no. Uh, ironically enough, no. Okay, I've got to say, um, just just thinking from the, I suppose from the idea, there are similarities. But then again, it's not like the X Files was the most original thing to start with either. Mm. All right, That's so great. let's 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 just you know let's not break bones over this. You know, the X Files with its the truth is out there, which which is like maybe that much truth and <laughs> that much fiction. You know, yeah. so. That's yeah, right. For everyone's intrigued about a conspiracy, as soon as you hear the word aliens and, and stuff, you, the whole the creative juices start going. Um, I'm of an age where I remember a TV show called The Invaders, mm -hmm. the original, not the Scott Bakula version 
or Bakula. You know, you want liquid names. Um, so the whole idea that there's aliens and monsters have been around from the first B B movie of the forties and fifties. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you manage to kind of then? First of all, Trevor, how do you manage to kind of merge all those different genres together? And then Sam, same sort of question for you because you've got, you know, the artistic elements. You've got noir. You've got science fiction. You've got the personal elements. How do you manage to sort of like meet? the tone and vibe. Trevor, we'll go with you first, then with Sam. Sure. I mean, I think primarily it, it all kind of comes from my storytelling influences. Um, I really enjoy crime uh, and the sort of tension um, mm-hmm. that some of the tools of the crime genre allowed you to build. So although this isn't quite a crime story, I think it is essentially a sci-fi um, narrative that is told through the sort of vehicle, right? Or like the window of a noir crime right. thriller. Um, so we use a lot of very sort of like close, deliberate camera angles in order to like add that sense of drama, uh, Mm -hmm. and atmosphere. Um, but really when it came to deciding on a genre, it was like following the most basic piece of advice I'd ever heard from writers. And it was just to write what you know. And, uh, in the States, um, you know, I spent, uh, far too much money learning about <laughs> molecular biology and genetics. So I was like, you know, I, I felt like I could add that element of sort of, I don't want to say academic authenticity because yeah, ultimately, no, it is, that. ultimately it, it, it's sci-fi, but there, yeah. all of the science fiction springboards from that. And so, you know, it, it really came down to, I have this idea. I have this sort of problem that I'm trying mm. to express, right. About, about the world telling us who to be and how to be that person. Um, and, and it really came down to what genres are going to give me the tools to best explore that, um, Mm -hmm. and to, um, sort of work, help this character, Kent, and, and maybe people reading the story, uh, how to work through that. And, and so doing that through that really grounded, that intimate and sort of permeative, um, landscape of noir, I felt was the best way to Mm -hmm. make this story feel both sort of grand, um, and feel like it's it's gonna it's gonna gut check you a little bit, and it's gonna pull you by the heartstrings. Okay, and Sam, so you've got all that going on, right? And you've done the research, you've done the first four books. You're like, yeah, I know where we're going. And then he drops script number five on you, and you're just like, so I've got noir, I've got sci-fi, I've got personal, I've got tight camera angles. Is there anything left for me to do? <laughs> Let me just tell you, um, Trevor. Trevor does this thing where. Like you would read, okay, you have four issues. Yes, you've, you've known any, everything about the world, about the characters. But then you go to issue five and you're like, do I really know everything about this story? <laughs> <laughs> Is there something I've missed? Because I have watched the X-Files. This is a very oh. big thing here in Nigeria. Like, yeah, okay. Flash Gordon, Star Wars. And I yeah. thought I was, yes, I'm ready for this. But when we started, and most especially when we started the very cover, I was like, this is a different book. It's not just about the noir or the sci-fi elements. I think the personal stories and the characters really like give those genres like a breath or this life force that really drives those genres together and entangles them and enwovens them into this huge tapestry of, you know, very big and very interesting reveals and very interesting characters. Like, I am so in love with a lot of the characters. I don't want to choose my favorite, but yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a whirlwind, but very fun. Yeah. Don't pick your favorite, because if you do, Trevor will kill them in the next issue. <laughs> <laughs> that's, see, that's, that's the joke of it all. They're, they're just all going to be dead yeah. at the end. Oh, man. It's like, look, all over again. I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> Nobody survives. <laughs> it's like on mass. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. So, Trevor, you mentioned your your molecular biology and how you want to bring that sense of not academia, but that kind of common sense, logical approach to the science used within the book. Mm-hmm. That sounds a lot. Sounds like a lot like Mark Wade and his fascination mm-hmm. with science stuff from his Justice League run after he took over Grant Morrison. Would you mm-hmm. say Wade's one of your kind of how he approaches stories is when you're kind of like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea of how you can incorporate some real scientific theory stroke practical applications into what you're doing. 
Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, him and Jeff Johns is, is typically pretty good about it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, just, I think adding that sort of qualitative and, and the quantitative elements of science Mm -hmm. help to make the fantastic feel a little bit more real. Mm -hmm. Um, which I, I think is, is it makes it easier to sort of cross that threshold of like the, the barrier or, or the suspension of disbelief. Um, and, and so my job as, as a writer and as a storyteller trying to make people believe and feel for this story is mm-hmm. to lower that barrier to entry as much as possible. Um, and fortunately, you know, I had I had a little bit of the training um, in order to to accomplish that. So it was, you know, really finding out how I can make my background uh, in molecular and cellular biology correlate best to telling the story. Uh, and fortunately, it, you know, it all, it all worked out pretty well. You know, my, mm-hmm. my focus for my undergraduate was uh, molecular genetics. So it, um, it, I think it gave me the tool to, to work through the sort of thematic elements of identity, right? Because DNA right. is literally your physical identity. So yeah. how can we sort of take that and expand upon that and um, bring it into a little bit more of a metaphysical uh, uh, sort of conversation about identity as well? So it's funny, I was just about to ask that, because if DNA is your physical identity, and then the characters are brought up with um, thinking they're something else, I sound like I wrote there, don't I? I must be someone else. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if they're going to be something else, like, so you, you've got the, the alien hiding in plain sight, so to speak, to then his DNA is in conflict with his his identity, that he's trying to forge for himself. That that's that's quite a that's quite a heavy story to try and get into a comic book, surely. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Trev's like, yeah, and, yeah. And. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it is, but I, I I think I think because it, it's ultimately uh, really relatable. Um, yeah, I, I think a... that relatability helped me make this a digestible story. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly, like from the beginning, it was really intimidating i mean this is the first comic book project i've i've ever worked on this is the first thing i've ever published um really? so that in and of itself yeah was was quite intimidating um but for me you know ultimately i think when you're telling a story like this you're trying to express a a, a problem or or an insight or, or a question that you have um about the world that you live in and so mm-hmm. for me you know being able to take something that i feel um and and put that into the fiction i think ultimately sort of helped me helped me manage it a little bit more you know it helped mm-hmm. me process all of the sort of story beats um and and relate to the the characters in the cast mm-hmm. cool all right excellent so um so sam how for, that sounds that sounds like quite a heavy deal when you're writing it then you get the job of actually showing what he's telling that's <laughs> Well, um, luckily, I would say I've had some practice with like very strong and emotionally damaging stories. I will leave this name. So I was kind of ready. I'm saying kind of because you know it's strange, right? I was kind of ready for what was in store. But looking at it and looking at how personal the story was and how like so like I felt like as I was as I started like the first. 10 pages and yeah. drawing the characters and knowing all the nuances of their being and everything. It got to a point, you know, you know, you're into the story as an artist when you are drawing a character crying and you're crying yourself. Oh, so that really? is where I'm wow. at. That is where I'm at right now because I had like, I have to get these characters the way I am reading them. And you get so engrossed in it and you just forget where you are until you press send <laughs> to Trevor. And you're like, oh, Wait, I'm back to my human form, so yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so there we have, after countless promises, this is your art, is it not? Yeah, it Sam? is. Yes, the, yes, at last. Yes, it is. Result. There's a, that's a lot going on that cover. That's a, that, that's a pretty heavy cover. You've got some, is that like DNA strands going on around there? Yeah. With yeah. kind of like the helix there. You've got the different, I suppose, characters and how they're going to interact and the DNA into mixing, which hints at stuff to come. Whoa. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Excellent. Is, Actually, uh, Trevor's idea to do the DNA thing. Yeah. And I was just, when I heard it, I was like, 
perfect, perfect. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, Sam took it in and just brought it to the next level. I mean, I mean uh, you know, being being able to collaborate with someone as thoughtful as Sam has been, um, you know, an absolute uh, joy in in the creative process. And you know, when I come to him with a sort of basic idea, a basic representation, you know, and he took it and he layered it with all of these sort of extra scientific elements like the neurons sort of flowing out and and even the fine art references there's a michelangelo reference in the cover that was that was just beautifully um sort of appropriated and i think and it, it, it's like that's i think the ultimate understanding for an artist to be able to take my concept as the writer mm -hmm. um and my ideas and just expand upon them and make them better than anything that i could have done by myself i mean this cover I remember when he sent it to me, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was more speechless than I am right now. Like I, yeah. I don't even know how to properly describe it. It is so good. It is so eye grabbing. It is so layered. Um, I mean, listen, I like if, if I have this tattooed on me at some point in the near future, don't be surprised. Oh, there you go. High, high praise indeed. That's my casual so. reference right there. It is absolutely a gorgeous cover. Absolutely. I, I love the faces. I suppose, Sam, this is one of the key elements you've got to do is, you know, you're talking about the, the, the highbrow elements of, of science fiction and all that sort of stuff, but you mentioned it before. It's an emotional story, so therefore you've yes, got to get your faces right. You know, exactly. I, I hate looking at comic book art and the faces don't work. It, mm -hmm. It's kind of like, it takes me... It takes me out of the moment quicker than, than than bad writing, to be fair. It's like, oh, man, you're trying to show, like, anger, and you're like, just, it just doesn't work. You've got to get, like, the, the, the passion. So yeah. that's well done. That's well done. Excellent. Right, we're going to take a quick break for one of our ads. Let me ask you gentlemen quickly, DC or Marvel fans? Both. I can't pick. <laughs> well, oh, good, because you want to work in the industry. Yeah, I'm not picking anybody. Well, I'm not, well, to be I'm fair. not offending anyone. No. <laughs> to be fair. Me neither. <laughs> to be fair, though, I have Marvel and DC tattoos. I mean, I've got Daredevil, I've got Watchmen, I've got Sandman. So. All right, okay. Okay. It, it's a hard choice for me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I didn't go bit like that about it. Okay. Let's then, let. what can we do that covers both of those? I'll tell you what, check out this. We have a crisis of questions here. Is it Marvel or DC? If it's a crisis you want, there's only one place to be, and that's the Toyverse. Check it out. I have to say, every time I watch that advert, I come away feeling hungry. So there you go. There you go. Crisis and Toyverse for everything that is figures. Who knows? Your guys might be on there soon. Who knows? Um, right. Let's talk about let's talk about how you both got into comic books. Sam, we'll start with you first. Um who how did you get into comic books over in Nigeria? Is it Marvel DC? Is it homegrown stuff? Um, well, it's um, kind of a, it's kind of like a very funny story because I was supposed to do, in my uni, we have this thing called IT, like an internship program, like you go to companies and okay. you intern for six months and you come back and have like a presentation of what you learned. And I studied computer science and it, something in my head just said, why don't you just go to a comic book company and work there? <laughs> and I was like, how exactly am I supposed to do that for computer science? And the voice just said, we'll figure it out when we get there. So, yeah, I started in a comic book company called Comic Republic Media. <clears throat> I studied drawing again, relearned, unlearned everything I, I knew. 
And um, from there, after the six months, I started this um, new, this comic book title called Metala um, with one of my um, writers. And from there, been doing a lot of stuff, metaverse and a lot of mostly social economic stories like from for Al Jazeera and all that. So I'm kind of happy I'm doing something a little more, I don't know, I won't say mainstream, but like has aliens in it and I could draw like <laughs> people getting punched and all that. I'm yeah. tired of drawing crying kids and all that, but I still yeah. want to do a lot of stuff like that. But yeah, that's how it yeah. started. So. so something this game. And I got an A on the project. Hey, well done. Yeah. <laughs> Round of applause for Sam. Well done. Excellent. Um, Trevor, yourself, how did you get in comic books? What was your kind of way in? I mean, it was kind of strange. Like, I, I mean, I was like, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up reading comics as a kid. I was a teenager, like well into it, 16, 17. Uh-huh. Um, really, uh, it was all um, a huge thunderstorm that was responsible. I was like hanging out at a friend's house. Uh, power went out because he kind of lived out in the sticks. Um, and he had a couple of Batman comics um, up in up in his place. And um really the first big thing i dove into was final crisis uh (laughs) and uh unlike most people somehow i was hooked i was like oh my god what's going on i have all these questions and rather than scaring me away i I was like i have to know what happens like why is batman dead uh, what's going on here? And obviously, like you had the uh, what was it, um, JG Jones artwork, which is stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there was an element of that story that told me, like, hey, comics aren't necessarily always for kids. And yeah. um, so, you know, I grew up loving Batman and the Batman animated series. Uh, I hear Kevin Conroy's voice in my head uh, uh, far too often than I should. And so, I I saw Grant Morrison's name. Um, on the most recent Batman run of the time. And from that point, I I skipped on there on into there started with um, stories like Batman and son, Batman rest Mm -hmm. in peace. And like that, that was like hook, line and sinker. I eventually Mm -hmm. went to the comic book store for the first time as a reader and was like, okay, uh, what do I do now? And (laughs) when next, (laughs) right. And then they were like, Oh, there's this thing called court of owls uh, by, by this guy, Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo. And at the time, the first two trades were out, and I just devoured those. I remember finishing that, going back immediately, and like, what's next? And <laughs> it's, you know it, it's bad. You know the addiction was bad, and I was so hooked because at the time, Death of the Family uh, was on pre-order, and it hadn't come out yet. And with those higher-profile books at the time, DC would do hardcovers first, soft covers months later. And at the time, I remember thinking to myself that the extra like $8 for the hardcover was like breaking my back. I was like, oh my God, like this is going to hurt. And I remember storming into like a Barnes and Noble and buying the hardcover and regretting absolutely none of it. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so from that point on, um, I became a Wednesday warrior. I, I started picking up um, the Batman single issues from zero year. I think it was like issue 25 yeah. and on. Uh, and that was it, man. Like, uh, like it, it, Batman steamrolled into Green Lantern and Flash in Justice League. And then eventually that steamrolled into me trying Marvel. And then, you know, I had this euphoric experience with indie comics um, kind of through Vertigo. Um, mm. Vertigo brought me into like modern image. And man, that's uh, that's it, man. The, the, the rest of the story is yet to be told. Cool. Do you feel, and I suppose... I, the, the question to both, of course. Um, Sam, I'm not sure what the comic book industry like is over in Nigeria. If you get the the all the big Marvels and, and DCs and stuff, do you think that the demise of Vertigo, so Vertigo being cancelled out, do you think that that's actually helped indie books form a, become more prominent? Because where people would probably stick to things like Hellblazer and Sandman for their supernatural and alt worldly kicks. They've now got this this epic indie industry where pretty much anything goes at any time. Mm. I think I think yeah, I, I've never thought about it that way. I mean, certainly when Vertigo closed it, its doors, I, I was lamenting it. I mean, I love Vertigo. 
Um, uh-huh. A lot of my favorite comics are Vertigo comics, um, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, Sandman or, or in recent years, Brian Hill's American Carnage was spectacular. Uh, um, Sandman Mystery Theater was mine. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, you could go on and on. Almost, almost all of my favorite comic book writers got their start in Vertigo. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think you pose a really interesting question. And the more I think about it, the more I think that it may be true because we're seeing this renaissance of indie comics right now Mm -hmm. and you're getting a an incredible amount of variety i mean you have this new webtoons generation with the sort of Mm -hmm. slice of life very sort of emphasized cartoonish uh style you have this quote unquote the quote unquote high art comic books that are reminiscent of the old school vertigo stuff and you still have the the sort of image boomer titles like spawn is probably bigger than it's been since the 90s so that's true yeah, it's 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 been incredible. I mean, you know, like most people, I got my start in comics reading Big Two, and now my my pull list has been absolutely like overborn <laughs> with indie titles because there's just so much good material right now. Yeah, that's true. That's a fair shot. Sam, what's it like in Nigeria? You get Big Two, you get indie books, you get very good. Well, I I think from my end, well, I think from my end, um, we were lucky enough to. I wouldn't say lucky, a lucky and a lucky at the same time because we really don't have the opportunity to get like DC comics or Marvel comics at any shop at that oh, time. So, that helps so when I was time. little, my mom would always like fish out the comic books from our church bookstore because you know churches they think is devilish and everything. But yeah, she would buy them <laughs> for me like stacks and stacks of comic books. Anything she saw. She would buy and she would just drop it there. It would be a mixture of like Marvel, DC, Vertigo, Image. But for me, I would like literally just take Batman and Superman and all that, put it by the side and look at American Vampire or um, I don't know, like all the, they were just so weird and so yeah. different. Yeah. And I was like, if I, like, I already watched Superman on TV and Batman and everything. I'm like, I want to know who these people are and what they're doing. Yeah. And so from Wildcats and um, Gen 13, <laughs> books like that. So I feel like <laughs> Vertigo leaving is painful, yes. Mm-hmm. And, but like the way indie stories are coming out and like just giving us these refreshing new ideas and new stories, it is yeah, just yeah. so beautiful. I'm really tired of seeing people in capes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, At least capes, we're <laughs> um, it's funny because I think no capes, no capes. No, um, I think I think there's a tra- there's an interesting trade off, isn't there? You know, if you go big two, you get brand recognition straight away, yeah. right? But you also get kind of tied into you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other. You've got to keep it. At the end of the story, press the reset button, it starts all over again. With an indie book. You get to do anything you like, mm-hmm. but you forego the brand recognition. Yeah. So it's kind of like, where's the trade-off? Which is, which is more, which can you deal with? You know, can you? Yeah. yeah. So it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma. I noticed a lot recently. A lot of indie writers uh, have have actually broken through, and artists as well. Then they're doing stuff for for big two. You know, um, Alex <laughs> Packnes will. Mm-hmm. Over at Marvel, Ram V for DC, mm-hmm. you know, who se- seems singularly handily trying to bring back Vertigo all in one go, bless him. <laughs> 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 That's cool. Um, right, let's have a quick look at your Kickstarter. So we are recording this on the 13th of June. Mm-hmm. So has your Kickstarter has it just gone live, is that right? Is it that it just from... launched. Yep, yeah, just launched today. Just launched today. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Let us see then. Um, where is it? It is there. Ooh. I'll bring it up for you in two seconds. I have to say, considering it's been up less than a day, check this out. You are currently sitting at um, $2,065 um, from a $6,500. God, that is practically what's that? That's a third. You're a third of the way already. Yeah, How's that feel? I mean, it feels great. Um, you know, knowing that this material is connecting with people and that, um, you know, folks go into it giving it a chance and um, 
come back because there's something about the story that they enjoy or relate mm -hmm. to. It is a, uh, it is the the greatest pleasure of doing what I do, you know, um, and and you know sharing this little batch of make believe uh, from my head with other people. Cool, forty days to go, forty three backers, and you're already a third in. That is that is pretty damn good, yeah, definitely. Um, of course, it's Kickstarter, so therefore we have the pledges. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, five bucks get you um, five dollars get you the digital copy. Well done, excellent. October, my birthday. Well done. Like that one. Um, six dollars or more get you the first print edition of issue five, cover A. Sam, that'll be your cover. I take it. Yes, I wouldn't get anybody yeah. else's cover. I'd, I'd be happy with that one, to be fair. <laughs> it's fine, okay. Um, Seven dollars more get you get you the variant. We don't want the variant, do we, Sam? We want your cover, right? <laughs> get the variant too, please. <laughs> get, the also... variant too. <laughs> get the variant too. Get the variant too, please. Get them both. Get both. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> that, just, that just screams teamwork. That doesn't. Listen, if it, if it helps, I'm getting them both. So you know, <laughs> no, like when I saw the variant, like I was, I was, I was like kind of mad because he took the snake idea. I was like, oh, the snake. I was like, that, okay, let's find that, something. That else. But it's such a beautiful cover, to be honest. Um, I was all so right. away. I'll tell you what, it's our background cover at the moment. To be fair, so let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's give it some. Let's give it some full, full attention, shall we? As we're all talking about the team, so let's see. I just don't know what this is going to look like against the actual cover that we're using as our backdrop, but we'll see. <gasps> there, look at that big mm. snake. Is it? Do you know what I find absolutely gobsmacked about some indie books right now, especially Kickstarters? It's a high production of them. Mm. If you get like, a, I'm always a physical copy guy. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a digital guy. I want I want the comic in my hand, you mm -hmm. know. So, I, someone I interviewed um, the, the guy who created um, Jack Harris, who created Terminus. Nice enough to send me a shirt. Thanks, man. And I've got to say, when the book came, I was like, it is gorgeous. I was like, whoa, you know, long gone are the, are the kind of like it's it's an indie book. It doesn't have the same process as the the big two. It's it's an mm -hmm. impressive impressive feat and when you look at how well the production value for your video goes i'm looking through the the digital copies as we speak colors are great it looks great it reads well how did you get taylor esposito on board because i mean the guy's a legend when it comes to lettering oh man um well first it started by making a sacrifice to the gods um <laughs> who did you sacrifice i'm not you know don't tell me don't tell me who but you don't have to buy as many Christmas presents now, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I think we've, I've foregone holidays for the rest of my life. Um, but no, I, I mean, it was, um, you know, really when it came down to it, one of the one of the most common pieces of advice I had heard from editors in the industry that I had respected um, was to take pride in the lettering because a lot of indie sure. folks don't. Uh, and they'll often kind of... Um, force themselves into a do-it-yourself model because it yeah. it feels less significant to them, but it, it's totally not true. I mean, you know, if you're going to make a movie reference, really, the letterers are your composers. And yeah. you think about how much that lends itself to the atmosphere and to the storytelling of a film. Mm. It does that tenfold in comics because that's your main mode. That's your, that's your, that's one of the, one of the main modes of communication in comics aside from the visual language. And so, you know, it, it was really all about finding a letterer who I felt, one, I, I could learn something from as an editor, right? Because I, I edit the book as well, um, and I do some freelance editing on the side. So for me, it's like, who can I work with that will also teach me something about the thing that I am not the quote-unquote expert in? Um, and so... You know, Taylor is obviously his name is ubiquitous in the comic book industry. Absolutely. You'll find him on, on books from every publisher. Uh, he's he's done some fantastic work, and I was just so lucky uh, to reach out to him. And I gave him the pitch, and I showed him some of the artwork, and I said, you know, Taylor, and I told him exactly what I told you. I was like, listen, I want to work with the best because I want to be the best, and I want to learn, um, and 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 I want to I want to be the guy 
you know, uh, 20 years from now that the next generation looks up to. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I have to surround myself with the most talented people I possibly can. And, um, I, you know, I guess the flattery worked. <laughs> and, uh, I was just, I'm just so fortunate to have Taylor, man. Uh, he's, he's provided so much experience and wisdom uh, in the creation process and mm. um, you know, what he's doing with um, his sort of elements of the storytelling through the lettering design and the sound effects and the placement is um, so welcome. And, and it does a lot for this book. I have to say, you talk about being an educator and I absolutely agree with you hundred percent. I follow him on uh, Twitter and mm -hmm. he was caught, this is going back a few years, um, and he, he was calling out, why do letters not get credits? And I was like, why don't letters get credits? Mm -hmm. What, you know? So when I was writing the reviews for Comic Crusaders, the writer gets a credit, the art gets credit, colors get a credit, letters get a credit. I mm -hmm. don't always do the variant colors because there's just too many of the damn things nowadays. Yeah. I then invited Taylor on to the show to talk about lettering and how important it is. And mm -hmm. you know what? I have never had such a great conversation about something mm -hmm. that someone takes for granted. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we do. Yeah. Sam, how's it for you? If you're working with a letterer, do you get to, do you have to, when you plot your page out in your panels, do you have to think, right, where does he want the, the, the word bubbles to go? Or do you kind of build your word bubbles in and Taylor goes in afterwards? How's that kind of work from an artist's point of view? Well, luckily, it works off the top of my head, and <laughs> so it always surprised me. If you know. <laughs> no, because I am always thinking of the lecture. Because I remember working, like lecturing, learning lecturing, and I I gave up because it was just a hassle. Because a lot of artists <laughs> kind of don't think that oh, there's somebody that's going to put like a bubble right yeah. there, and then you just put like a full head with eyes and noses and yeah but yeah it's kind of like a second nature subconscious thing when i'm drawing i'm like where is this person supposed to talk and all that yeah. so i hope i do my best <laughs> with this one and yeah i would say so it's, it's it's an important thing to have thinking about who else is going to work on this book that's not just that's your book true. not just your art it's other people that are going to share the pages and all that so you have to think like you're a community of people working on this. Mm. Yeah. That's a good shout. That's a good shout. I could never be a lecturer because my, 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 my spelling sucks. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and to, to Sam's point, like having that, that layer of removal and being able to think about what you are doing in tandem with the rest of the creative team is key mm. um, to, to the cohesive relationship because it, it changes everything, you know, um, and you, you really do want to think about what you can do to bring out the best in, in whoever is going to be taking part in the next step in the creative process. Cool. Uh, I mean, I so Taylor actually teaches a lettering class through the Kubert School. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I took I took the class um, simply to be a better editor, to know what the editor, what more about what the letter is doing, garner a, a greater respect for what they're doing and understand how as the writer, how as the editor, how as, as the, I guess, art director of the series – how we can best uh, give give the letter, or in this case, Taylor, the opportunity to shine and to bring mm -hmm. his best to the book. And that's super important. Um, and, and it goes, it starts from the top. It starts, it starts with the writer and, and in their script and, and giving, um, you know, their collaborators what they need. Cause every creative relationship is, is, is different. You know, yep, um, I, uh, uh, working with Marcelo on the first four issues taught me a lot, but working with Marcelo is different from working with Sam. Um, mm. So much so that when when I realized what my collaborative relationship was like with Sam, we added an extra four pages to issue five. I re-edited the entire last half because I was like, OK, I know what Sam is, what how, how I'm beginning to understand how Sam works um, and what he's going to be able to bring to this story. How can I make this script more suited to Sam's strengths? Oh, that's a good and, well, yeah, that's a good call. You know, and that yeah. that told me. I'm going to add these extra four pages and we are going to bring a real presence to the end of this fifth issue in a way that we haven't quite gotten to do before. Cool. So basically what he's doing, Sam, is he's, he's, he's getting more work out of you for the same page. Just saying. <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. I'm joking. All right. So my final question, then this kind of, you've led, led me to this point, I suppose, with, with the discussion that we're having that right now. Um, Trevor, you said you're an editor as well as the writer of the book. All right, so Sam, 
question for you then is, what sort of editor is Trevor? Is he kind of like a laid back guy or is he a bit of a takeover Ted? And I suppose the flip <laughs> question, Trevor, when you get the R back from Sam, are you like, why or why did he do this? Or are you like, wow, let's just do that? I'll let <laughs> I'll Sam go. go first. So, Sam, what's up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, like, to be honest with you, I feel like Trevor is one of the aliens amongst us because <laughs> when, you read his, when I read his script, I'm like, Okay, he's telling me what to do, but he's also telling me to do my thing. So it's like a list of instructions, but also within the lines. Do you, I don't know how he does the balance, but it's a very good balance of, yes, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. But subconsciously, you are just like also putting yourself in the art. I don't know how to explain it, but no, I don't no, know I how he does it. Maybe it's by mistake. It's, it's it's sort of directions. <laughs> but yeah, it's a very then, good it's a very good balance. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. It's a very good balance of right. this is what balanced. I want. Also do your thing. Is that is, yeah. that, is, is that a compliment, Trevor? You're balanced? Or you, yeah, I, you I mean, you know, <laughs> it's it's a it's a weird thing. Um like my scripts normally for a twenty four page book are are like forty eight to fifty pages, although uh, I've also been told that there is um I, I don't I don't muddy the page down with dialogue or too many captions mm -hmm. um, because I believe in in making a lot of the storytelling indication through the visual artwork. I mean, ultimately, okay. comics are a visual medium. Yeah, um, sure and as, right. And, and as much as I want to be this poetic show off of a writer, um, that's that's not what I'm in comics for. I'm in comics to work with the talented people like Sam mm -hmm. um, who are going to be able to communicate this idea um, visually. And so for me, it's about laying down that blueprint and really saying, listen, this is just a blueprint, you know, and what's here, I hope will give you an idea of what we're shooting for. And if you're like, hey, I see what you're going for. I think we can do this in order to bring that home a little bit better. That's mm -hmm. always the number one priority is is making this collaborative um, process osmotic mm -hmm. between the two of us, because as much as I have relatively clear ideas, um, I also know that you know, Sam is going to process the visual language of comics more fluently in a way that I can't. And so he's going to be able to tell me, Hey, I see what you're going for. I don't know if that quite works. Mm -hmm. We can accomplish that by doing it this way. And cool. so that's always been, that's always been really key for me in this process. Um, and, and just being able to, you know, take that, take that in stride and, and be able cool. to work, you know, um, by kind of shutting down my ego a little bit, you know? You know what? That's that's such a that's such a modest thing to say, you know. Because when people are writers and and editors themselves, it's like their baby. It's my baby. This is it's my way or the highway. And yeah, you know, to like to take a step back and you know, it's it's one thing given instruction as Sam was saying, but there's also that ability to let the artist breathe into the work, right? And the fact yeah. that you've had to amend the script, to add extra pages to accommodate Sam's artistic style. I think I just I think I just it speaks volumes, you know. It well, just speaks I, from a from a, an overall perspective point of view. I'm really impressed. I have to say, uh, I am really impressed. So yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And really, at the end of the day, I, it comes down to, you know, um, I asked Sam to work with me because I knew there was something he could bring to the book that mm. I can't. Um, if I thought I could do it by myself, I would, and I can't. It's simple as that. I need to work with other creative minds that can do things that I'm not able to do, and and do some things that I can do, but better. Um, and, and that's exactly why I have, you know, why I'm fortunate enough to, to have Sam because, you know, I can give him a, a sort of understanding of what I'm trying to do and he can, he can interpret that and find ways to best communicate that um, in, in the visual storytelling. And I think, I think it comes through, you know, this, this fifth issue, um, it might be the best issue in the whole series, like, like start to finish so far. I mean, it's incredible. It's it's cinematic. It is. It takes full advantage of the quiet nature of this comic book. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that a couple of reviewers have made a point at are, are that there are several moments in the book where um, we let things be still and quiet, and in order mm -hmm. to basically gut check you um, emotionally using the characters mm -hmm. and the camera. And Sam one thousand percent delivers on that. There's this really great sequence um, where you learn a little bit about the backstory of the antagonist of the series um, and, and the way that Sam was able to 
bring that to life visually just goes above and beyond anything I, I would have cool. possibly had in my head. Cool. So that, let's also that, talk about how you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and these and these are the bits that make because <laughs> when when I read it, I was like, "Wow, okay, am I watching a movie?" Or <laughs> so I think that's what really got me to like express myself because I read it like I was reading like, "Okay, this is kind of like something I would see in the silver screen." I was like, "Yeah, we have to, we have to do justice definitely. to this." So definitely, it was yeah. Sounds great. Sounds great. Right. So for everything, Pocket Watch Press. There, there is the several platforms. You've got social media. You've got your Twitter there. You've got your Instagram and you've got your Facebook. Um, so feel free to pause the video. Not when I'm pulling the face. Thank you very much. Don't want to look like an idiot. Um, mm. So you can click on those at any time. Um, the Kickstarter, there's the page. Check it out. You can go and back that book. Just remember, guys, it's been open less than a day. And you're already a third of the way there. That's immense. And there's 40 days to go yet. Really? I'm going to check back in a week's time. It'll be fully funded before then. <laughs> I am pretty sure. Um, and also, um, with uh, Pocket Watch, uh, you've got some merch. So you can check out darknightnation.com shop. Um, and you can see all sorts of crazy merch going on. What I will do before we go, I'll just share some love for that uh that nation boo um where's my there we are at the stream there you go so there you go you've got some uh comic books oh i quite like the uh like the bomber jacket that sounds that looks cool doesn't it mm. yeah, Thank you. yeah a hoodie there oh, i like the color of that burgundy <gasps> and gray as well so there's loads of merch there you can get yourself into. Um, sorry, Sam. I really like that cover there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I like the cup and the beanie hat. Oh, man. So if you're a big fan, by all means, check that out. Um, I, will run the, I will run the link again so you can see that. There you go. Check that there. All right. Yeah. So full court press for this one. Yeah, yeah. get all sorts going on. Excellent. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, and uh cool thing too, uh on the Kickstarter there are like limited edition merchandise items, um, some of which don't get re-released. So the shirt I'm wearing now is actually uh the Kickstarter exclusive that uh we're calling the process shirt. So uh for example, it has one of the cover arts with the original layout sketch, the inks and the colors. Uh um, oh, like that. So that's a good call. This is going to be exclusive to the Kickstarter. Uh, there's also a really cool T-shirt design that I'm fond of with that um, uh, issue one reprint cover that you had shown uh, mm -hmm. with a quote that I think is becoming more and more synonymous with our books. Uh, and it says, uh, be dangerous, read comics, uh, featuring that artwork, which um, I, I think pe people are eating up so far. Yeah, yeah. So if you want some cool swag, I there's a lot. Yeah, really well, cool. just, just so you know, I'm an extra large. All right. You got <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> all right there we go we're out for this show trevor thank you so much for hanging with me sam thank you so much for joining the conversation i love it when we get writers and artists together work talk about the books the level of passion are just brilliant and guys don't forget to check out the, the kickstarter trevor you were say i jumped over you there sorry no no it's okay and this is the first time uh i've been fortunate enough to do an interview with a member of the creative team and it, it it's an absolute blast so um you know people should uh show show sam a little bit of love um for making it all the way out here from lagos yeah definitely well done power the internet that's what that bad boy is <laughs> all right don't forget to check out the ucpn for all your favorite shows including the uh, crisis in the toy verse and if you like dc trevor the no the, the definitive crusade all about DC books. And if you like Marvel, of course, we have the No Prize podcast for everything that is Marvel, Disney Plus, and MCU. So expect lots of Obi-Wan and lots of Thor coming your way on those pods. There you go. So, Trevor, Samuel, thank you so much for spending the time. I really do appreciate it. The book looks great. The, the, thank you. Everything looks great. I am absolutely so pleased I've had the opportunity to speak to you as both. That's been brilliant. 
Oh, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time. I'm grateful for you sharing your You're platform welcome. with the book. And, uh, you know, it, I'm delighted to hear that uh, that you enjoy it. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it. And uh, obviously, thank you to Sam for, for coming out and joining us. <laughs> thank you for having me, guys. You're more so, than welcome. All right. I've been your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. And as always, adios. Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.